lay down my burden. I'm gonna lay down, down by the riverside. Beside, beside, down by the riverside. Beside, 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 down by the riverside. I'm gonna lay down my burden. I'm down by the riverside to steady war no more. Steady war no more. Steady war no more, ain't gonna steady war no more, my lord. Ain't gonna steady war no more, ain't gonna steady war no more, ain't gonna steady war no more. Shadrach, Meshach, Essen Lockridge was born on March the 7th, 1913 in Robertson County, Texas. He was the oldest of eight children to a Baptist preacher. Essen Lockridge was a major religious and social force in San Diego for decades. As pastor of Calvary Baptist Church and the president of the California Missionary Baptist State Convention, he was known for his evangelical conferences, powerful preaching, and civil rights activism. He had a great sense of humor, but was always very serious when preaching the Word of God. He was a giant among preachers. Lockridge was on the faculty of the Billy Graham School of Evangelism and the Greater Los Angeles Sunday School Convention. His publications included Rekindling the Holy Fires and The Lordship of Christ. Standing six feet tall, S.M. Lockridge's voice was firm, commanding respect. In all of the years of his preaching, neither his voice nor his vision ever faded. Being the son of a preacher, my father was a preacher during the Great Depression, he recalls, and I looked at the ministry from a material angle. I saw my dad suffer with small churches. People at the time were mean, contrary, and very difficult. I thought I could do anything but be a pastor. But when I graduated from high school at the age of 18, I felt a call of the Lord. But as far as preaching, I thought I could escape that idea, Lockridge recalls. Lockridge enrolled in Bishop College to learn anything besides preaching. After graduating from Bishop, he taught high school in Lorena, Texas, but he found himself preaching in the classroom. One day while teaching a physical science lesson, he stood in front of his students and proclaimed the truth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Lockridge chuckles, I tell people I'm preaching because I can't help myself. I didn't want to do it, but now I wouldn't take anything for it. I just wish I had accepted the call long before I did. Strangely enough, it was the influence of people of God that kept Lockridge from salvation at an earlier age. The people of my father's church picked at me because I was a preacher's son. They'd say, SM, you ought to do this because your dad's a preacher but they never once told me who Jesus was or tried to lead me to the Lord. Whenever I'd see them coming, I'd leave home and try to stay out of their way. The people at that church would chide him, their heads waging in disapproval. SM, you're a big boy now. Why are you not singing in the choir? He never heard a word about the Lord from those well-intentioned people, but one night as a senior in high school, Lockridge went for a walk by himself and looking up at the starry sky, he thought of how high and holy God was, and how lowly and unworthy he was. I looked up and gave the Lord my heart, he says, smiling. I asked him to come into my heart and my soul, and the Lord Jesus Christ did. Lockridge pastored churches in Texas for 12 years, and after his graduation from Southwestern Seminary in 1952, he accepted the pastorate of Calvary Baptist Church in San Diego, California. He had pastored there for many years, and his people loved him for his compassion, patience, kindness, and consideration. One church member once said, He is all that you would expect a Christian to be in one package. He never changes. SM never wavers. The church people loved him. 
Despite his busy schedule, he always took time for children, the elderly, the youth, and anyone who needed him. Lockridge's greatest joy is preaching the gospel. I love preaching. I love teaching, he says with enthusiasm. My greatest opportunity was a few years ago when I was used in 44 countries to spread the good news. I was sent by the Southern Baptist Foreign Mission Board to several mission fields. I preached in Southeast Asia just as the war was winding down. One of the greatest opportunities for service I've had was preaching in 21 Air Force bases around the world, beginning at the Air Force Base Academy in Colorado Springs. Some members of his church resisted their pastor's popularity as a preacher slash teacher. During a 20-year period, Lockridge was gone the first part of every week, preaching in many cities around the world. His people at Calvary urged him to stay put. We called you to stay here, but Lockridge replied, The Lord called me not only to witness to those here in Jerusalem, but in Judea and in the uttermost parts of the earth. Whenever the Lord sends an opportunity to spread the gospel, Lockridge was there to answer the call. His attitude had earned him the love and devotion of the members of the Calvary Baptist Church. Lockridge deeply loved being their pastor. The best thing about my people at my church is that they love the Lord and they love to learn about His Word and share it with others. That's what I love about this church. Along with his duties as pastor, Lockridge also served as a professor of homiletics at the California Graduate School of Theology in Glendale. Anyone who had ever heard S.M. Lockridge preach will not soon forget it. His sermons were legendary. He had a talent and the necessary skill to breathe life into otherwise routine preacher stories. His presentation makes the scriptures come alive. He particularly enjoyed the use of humor in his sermons. There is definitely a place for humor, he recalls, even in the pulpit. I have found that humor captures people's attention. If you can say something that people are interested in hearing, they will listen, and they'll listen to you more carefully. As much as he enjoyed preaching, Lockridge found that the ministry was not without its frustrations. The thing I find frustrating is the lack of commitment on the part of those who claim to be called to spread the gospel. That's really disgusting to me, he says flatly. I see many fellow preachers who view the ministry like a chosen profession and they try to pastor church on a social or a secular basis. He shared the view of other black pastors that too many black churches are overemphasizing the social aspects of the gospel rather than evangelism. Some in our church would like this to be a black folks church, but I preach whosoever will come. When Lockridge went out to witness to the lost, he approached anyone he met. I don't witness to just black folk. I take every person as I come to him, regardless of his race, economic status or how he looks. I had to convince many people that yes, I'm called to pastor this church, but I'm also called to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. For younger pastors, Lockridge would have this advice. Stay in the study chamber of faith and on the watchtower of prayer. Study the word and proclaim it as the Holy Spirit leads you. Don't try to copy anybody else like I tried to do. I wanted to be like this preacher or that preacher, but I found that the Lord called me individually, and if I waited on Him, He would give me what He wanted me to have. His favorite words of wisdom were found in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 30 and 31. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Lockridge said that even as a young Christian, I still found temptations to follow the crowd and go wrong, but I had to trust in the Lord and wait on Him. When I began to practice that, I became stronger as a Christian, and I could stand on my own feet and not try to copy anybody else. When I would see older pastors getting into trouble, I was more determined to do what was right. Those verses were a guideline for my life and my ministry. Every man is likely to fail if he doesn't follow and trust in the Lord. In 1940, while in Dallas, Texas, S.M. Lockridge surrendered his life to the calling to preach. The following year, Lockridge would marry his wife of 58 years, Virgil May Thompson. In 1942, Lockridge would pastor his first church, 
called the Fort Ward Baptist Church located in Enos, Texas. Fort Ward Baptist Church would be the first of multiple pastorates until 1952. Lockridge attended Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, while still pastoring in multiple revivals, conferences, schools, and other church venues. In 1953, he would then pastor his final church at Calvary Baptist Church in San Diego, California, again until the year 1993. While pastoring at Calvary Baptist Church, and in addition to working with the Billy Graham School of Evangelism as a faculty member, Lockridge also served the Greater Los Angeles Sunday School Convention. He was the moderator of the Progressive Baptist District Association, president of the California Missionary Baptist State Convention, Lockridge would also become the first president of the National Missionary Baptist Convention of America, where he served until retirement in 1994. Despite all of the notoriety and prominent positions that he held, Lockridge would see himself as simply a gospel preacher, where he committed his life to the work of an evangelist. In his publication, The Challenge of the Church, Lockridge encouraged believers to fulfill the evangelistic mission rooted in the biblical commission of the Lord. S.M. Lockridge fully submitted himself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. People who heard the sermons and messages from Lockridge were amazed and astonished, primarily in two observable features. He had the ability to breathe life into routine stories. One example was a sermon where he elaborated on the existence of God. You remember back during the 60s, the offbeat theologians romped around in their subsurface playpens and emerged and announced that God was dead. Now, that shouldn't have been surprising to us because the Bible has informed us that the fool had said in his heart there is no God. And when I first heard that absurd statement, it made me want to ask some stupid and senseless questions like who assassinated God, what coroner was called, who signed his death certificate, and who was so well acquainted with the one pronounced dead that he could identify the deceased. In what obituary column did you find his name, and why was I not notified? I'm a member of the family. Lockridge was committed to the preaching of the Word of God with reverence to the Lord. Thus, his second observable feature was his exaltation. The hinges of human history have been turned on the strength of the insignificant man who has linked his life with the Lordship of Christ. Rivers of civilization have cut new courses because of the courage of men who have come under the loving Lordship of Jesus Christ. The question is asked, is this topic relevant? What is in it for us in our kind of a day? For the lost, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the nation... Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. For those who claim to be committed to the cause of Christ, acknowledgement of Christ's authority is to be accomplished and accompanied by absolute obedience to his commandments. The only rightful Lord of our lives is Jesus Christ. In order for him to be the Prince of Peace, a coronation service has to be held. You will have to crown him king in your own heart. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lockridge's faithfulness to evangelism was founded on four primary elements. One, the key word of God. Two, prayer. Three, God's call upon the preacher's life. 
and four, full reliance upon God. Dr. Rev. Shadrach Meshach S.M. Lockridge would go home to be with his Lord on Tuesday, April the 4th, the year 2000. Our Father, I thy servant need thee now. Speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. Amen.